welcome Liz, and she's going to talk to us about wildlife ecotourism. Thank you, Ashley. So yeah, so thanks to Ashley and Jennifer for inviting me down here to speak with y'all today about wildlife ecotourism. Um, I will caveat, I am a bird person, so a lot of the examples that I will use will probably like end up working its way toward birds because that's how my brain works. Um, but I will try and mention mammals in there as well. And luckily, just about everything that I'm gonna speak about can very easily be applied to mammals. Um, so I'm a wildlife program specialist with um, AgriLife Extension. Um, like Ashley said, I'm based up in Uvalde. Um, but okay, so we're gonna get started. I'm gonna first cover just a little bit of background information as to what ecotourism is. Some of y'all have probably already heard this word, but I'm gonna go through and just make sure that y'all have a good idea of what it is and what it is not. So travel in general has been something that has been around ever since the lights came on, ever since people were about, we have traveled to go find food, to travel to find water, to go to war. But as society developed, travel for pleasure became something that was restricted to those elite classes. Because you had to pack up your carriage, you brought along your little entourage that cooked for you and set up your bed, and it was a whole ordeal. To go 100 miles, it would take you maybe just a little bit shy of a week to get there. So it was a big, big to do. But once the Industrial Revolution came around, we had automobiles, we had trains. So transportation became a lot more economically it, 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 was, it was just easier for people to do it on a budget. So along with the Industrial Revolution, we had a lot of global effects from that. We developed not only trains and automobiles, but we became more efficient at a lot of things. You could go through and you could take out a forest very, very quickly. You had mechanized pieces of machinery, um, market hunting, so the mass harvest of of bison is the big one. I'm sure you all have probably seen the picture of the big stack of bison skulls and somebody standing at the base of it. And we started to realize that a lot of these resources, they're, we have a finite number of resources and we need to protect those. So the first national park, we established the first national park in 1872 now. I realize that y'all just had a little bit of a snack, which first off, I'm very glad that I am now not standing between you and lunch. Y'all have been fed a little bit. However, hopefully y'all will not get super tired. But pop quiz, what was our first national park? Yellowstone. Yellowstone, Ernesto, sorry. I was gonna, you were gonna be my last, my last call, but yeah, so Yellowstone National Park. Yellowstone National Park was established by, or signed in by Ulysses S. Grant. <coughs> Excuse me. So this was sort of that first step into ecotourism where we were now putting an economic value on natural resources. People were paying to go see the, um, see Old Faithful, to see the hot springs, to see the bison. And the National Park Service was created in 1916 to now regulate this. So fast forward to where we are now. And the definition of, of ecotourism, which this is the definition from the International Ecotourism Society, which they're sort of the forerunners and basically kind of like the experts, I would say, on ecotourism. And their definition is the responsible travel to natural areas that conserves the environment sustains the well-being of the local people and involves the interpretation and education. So we're gonna talk about the pillars of ecotourism and this is basically those last three points that they covered in the definition. So ecotourism, the first component is conservation. So like I've already stated, you are now putting an economic value on a natural resource so people are paying to enjoy that natural resource, whatever it may be. Could be plants, could be animals, could be rock formations, what have you. The second component or pillar is the community's aspect. So because people are coming in to pay to see that resource, a lot of these people are traveling from 
long distances. Could be within the country, could be they're traveling internationally to see these. And whenever they travel, they need a place to stay. They need accommodations. They need um, potentially airfare to get there. They need to eat. And you need to hire people to support those, to be able to feed people, to run those hotels, to run tours, um, to educate people on that natural resource. And then that interpretations aspect, which I just covered on, is you are now teaching people that come here that you know, they've heard about this resource like Old Faithful, they've heard about it, but whenever they get there, they learn more about it. The park rangers are there to explain to people why the geyser does what it does. And people, whenever they come, they learn about it. And then whenever they go back home, they share that with people, you know, why this was important, why we need to conserve this resource, even though it may not be a resource that they have in their community. Okay, principles of ecotourism. So some, most of these we just covered, but the biggest one for ecotourism is it, it is non-consumptive or non-extractive, meaning that resource does not leave. So for this case, hunting is not considered ecotourism because you are harvesting that animal, you're pulling it off the landscape. Fishing is one of those that kind of falls in like a little bit of a gray area. If you remove the, if you, um, if it's a catch and release scenario, you could categorize it as ecotourism. But if people are removing the fish to consume it, does not fall under ecotourism. Um, so these next two bullet points that create an ecological conscience and values and ethics in relation to nature, we kind of already, you know, I discussed that a little bit where you're now educating those people on that resource. So whenever they leave, they feel like they, they want to save this resource because they enjoyed it. They want their kids to enjoy it, their neighbors, other people in their community to be able to come and enjoy that resource. Um, you know, and even if they don't have a similar resource in their community, they may start to make better decisions that are just going to, in, that are, that are going to benefit their ecosystem as a whole, meaning, you know, they walk by a piece of trash and instead of walking by it, not picking it up, they may decide, you know what, I should pick this up, throw this away rather than just leaving it there. Something as simple as that. Okay, create and, create and operate a low impact facility. Now this is one that kind of makes sense. The point of ecotourism is people coming, enjoying the resource. The last thing you want to do is put up and build this big hulking facility that is, you know, develop or um, producing a bunch of trash and byproducts and you're chucking it into the environment. It's like, you need to save this, but just forget about this giant building I have behind me that's doing everything against, is against everything that we're trying to do. Um, and lastly, I touched on that financial benefits already. Okay, we're gonna dive into some numbers because I don't know about y'all, but numbers have a tendency to make a bigger impact. If y'all take anything away, these are, this is probably the big um, convincing point that I have for y'all, that there is an industry for ecotourism. And we're gonna start on a large scale, we'll go global, national scale, and we'll actually narrow it all the way down to y'all here in the Rio Grande Valley and what um, ecotourism could do for y'all. So on a global scale, ecotourism is expected to grow roughly 15.2% every year between 2022 and 2030. So that is quite, quite a growth every single year. And in 2021, which again, we know what was going on in 2021, so this number is probably a little bit on the low side of things. But in 2021, the global market was estimated to be about $185 billion. That's with a B. That's a, that's a huge industry. And it's only going to continue to grow at a roughly 15% every single year. Now, the reason that ecotourism is growing is for a couple different reasons. The first one is environmental awareness. So myself, my generation, so I'm the millennial generation, we grew up learning about, in school, deforestation is, 
is bad, which it is. Pollution is bad, which it is. We have now grown up. We now have, you know, big kid jobs. We have some expendable income that we can now go on vacation. We get to decide where our money goes. And growing up learning that all these different things are bad, we have a little bit more of an environmentally conscious um, view of things. We don't want to have as big of an impact. So a lot of our funds, are, we, when we make our decision where we're going to go on vacation, you know, we're going to be make some maybe more environmentally conscious decisions. The last one is over tourism. And what over tourism is, is when people go on vacation, you know, a lot of people when you say vacation, they think of going to the beach, going to Disney World or some other amusement park. And when you go to these places, you are pushing and shoving for every inch of your personal space because there are just so many people at all these different locations. And generally when you go on vacation, you go to relax. You don't go to play bumper cars with somebody that you have never met in your life. So people are now choosing eco-tourism, which a lot of these times, it's not everyone's cup of tea. Not everybody wants to go to the middle of nowhere and watch birds or chase after some rare reptile or something like that. Go hiking, go climbing Mount Everest, what have you. But for those people that are, that ecotourism is something that they're interested in, they're now going to these remote locations to actually get the benefits of vacation and relax and not have to fight people. So instead of coming back from vacation more stressed out than when they went and having to take a vacation from their vacation before they go back to work, they're nice and relaxed. Okay, we're gonna narrow it down now to the nationals. So here in the United States. Now all these numbers I'm going to present are from the, I have to read this because I always mess this up, is from the 2022 National Survey of Fish, Hunting, and Wildlife Associated Recreation. And, oh, one thing I did forget to mention is, so I do have a literature cited slide at the very end. So if y'all wanna go, you know, after you leave here and you wanna go sit down and read a bunch of fun, like research papers, you can go do that. And I have all the articles that y'all can go read. Um, so, yeah, on the national scale. So this is broken down into, like the title said, it's broken down into hunting, fishing, and wildlife uh, what do they say? Wildlife Associated Recreation. Now, like I said, fishing and hunting are two of those categories that, you know, fishing is kind of a gray area, hunting is not considered ecotourism. So we are gonna focus on the wildlife watching side of things. And what somebody that is a wildlife watcher is categorized as somebody that observes, photographs, or feeds wildlife. And all these numbers that I'm going to present to y'all are people we call, um, they are intentional wildlife watchers, meaning they are going to a specific location with the express um, purpose of viewing wildlife. It's not, I'm driving to the grocery store and I just happen to see a bird, I just happen to see a deer. It's, I'm going there to see a deer. I am going there to see birds. So in the United States alone, 148 million people categorize themselves as being wildlife watchers. So I forget, I should have looked this up. I forget what the population here is in the United States, but that's, yeah, pretty good chunk of the population that watches wildlife. <clears throat> and those people spend about $395 billion a year. So, this is how much money spent that $395 billion. And then it's broken down into those hunting, fishing, and then wildlife watching. So which the numbers that y'all need to be looking at is that 63% or $250.2 billion. So that's over half of what is spent on wildlife related, related recreation. So now I'm gonna break this down for I say I. The people that did this report they break it down even further into what those people were spending that $250 billion on. So the first part is equipment. 
which unless y'all are going to start your own backpack company or start making hiking boots um, or a wide variety of other different equipment, you're not necessarily gonna have a chunk of that. But what y'all are gonna be able to take advantage of is that those trip-related expenses and that other. So trip-related expenses are gonna be those accommodations, is going to be the food, the fuel, the airfare. Now the other it encompasses all sorts of different things, which what y'all can take advantage of is if you were to sell informational booklets, to sell magazines, I think DVDs really aren't much of a thing anymore. People still watch them though, I do anyway. Um, you know, DVDs or, or other media, that's what y'all can take advantage of. So y'all are gonna be able to take advantage of just over half of that $250 billion. So moving on from money a little bit, we're going to now start looking at the actual people themselves. So these people can be categorized as one of two. They are either what they call away from home participants or at home participants. So at home participants are going to be viewing wildlife within one mile of their home. So they can be sitting on their back porch watching wildlife. They really don't leave their home. What y'all are gonna focus on are those away from home participants. So they are traveling more than a mile away to go watch wildlife. And in the US there's about um, 73.3 million people categorize themselves as away from home participants, which is still a pretty good number. Now, of those away from home participants, they ask those people, okay, if you are going to view wildlife, what, what group of wildlife are you going to go watch? And not necessarily surprisingly, at least for me, not surprisingly, it's, it's birds. And now some of y'all are probably looking at this and you're like, these numbers don't add up 73.3 million people away from home, but then we have 96.3 million people that observe wild birds, numbers don't add up. That also includes your away from home participants as well, or excuse me, your at home participants. So 42.6 million away from home participants traveled to go see, to go watch birds. And the one, I, was, I hate to say, the one gripe I have about this report is, so they do this report roughly every five years. So the previous report was in 2016. In 2016, they broke down, a, they gave you a lot more information. For some reason, in this 2022 report, they kept it pretty basic. But in the 2016 report, they asked people, if you were going to go watch birds, what group of birds did you, what, what did people go to see? And this honestly surprised me. Um, tied for, for first was people actually traveled to go see birds of prey and waterfowl. If you'd asked me, I would have said songbirds was number one, hands down. I was wrong. They were tied for basically for second place. So people are traveling to go see waterfowl and birds of prey. Okay, looking at some of the demographics of people. So this is the age breakdown of people that go to wildlife watch. And as you can see, pretty well across the board, it's, it's fairly even with the exception of that 16 and 17 year age bracket. It's only about 4%. You know, they have limited modes of transportation. Um, parents are generally paying for it at that point. But the point of this, what I want you all to think about is if you do decide to go into ecotourism is I would advise, I'm not going to say you need to, I would advise making your property accessible to all age classes, that just about anybody is going to come to view your property um, or what's on your property. Um, lost my train of thought, but I said the most important thing. <laughs> it's the pregnancy brain. It's the thing. Okay, last slide that I have for the national, um, the national data. So if we look at where these away from home participants reside, a lot of the people, oh, so let me break this down. So MSA basically stands for it's metropolitan areas. Large is considered a um, metropolitan area that has a population of greater than a million. 
Medium is 250,000 all the way up to a million. Small is 50,000 up to 250,000. And this one was a new one for me, Micropolitan, which is um, 10,000 all the way up to 50,000. And then anything less than a population of 10,000 is considered to be outside of a metropolitan area. So apparently I live in a micropolitan area. Um, which I'm not sure how I feel about that. I prefer to live outside of a metropolitan area, to be perfectly honest. Um, but yeah, as you can see, a, a large majority of your away from home participants, not necessarily surprisingly, are gonna come from those large metropolitan areas. So when it comes to um, advertising for your property, think about looking at your larger, your, your nearest large metropolitan area or even your medium metropolitan areas because that's where most of your people are going to end up coming from. A lot of those metropolitan, those large metropolitan areas, the one I think of because I'm from the East Coast is New York City. New York City, concrete jungle, really the only places they have are places like Central Park, which yes, it has trees, it has grass, it has plants compared to the vast majority of the city, but it's very manicured. People come in, they mow the, law, the, the yards, they keep everything, you know, nice and, you know, tidy. So it's not great for all wildlife species. So these people, if they want to see different ones, they're going to need to leave those metropolitan areas to go see them. Okay, so now we're going to focus in here in the Rio Grande Valley. Now, unfortunately with this paper, it was done in 2011. So it's been a hot minute since these numbers were reported. All of these um, tables that I'm going to show y'all, I do have a section where I went in and basically, cha I didn't change these numbers. I figured out, I say I figured out, punched numbers into uh, a uh, little program that gave me new numbers based upon inflation. So y'all can get a good idea of what people hypothetically would be spending nowadays versus in 2011, because a lot has changed since 2011. So this study was done in Hildago and Cameron County. And what they did was, is they came in and did, uh, they uh, did ask people to complete surveys during peak and off peak. So what they considered to be peak was November, make sure I'm doing this, excuse me, October, November, and December. And then off-peak times were May and June. So what they found was that people that came here, their average group size was 2.3 people. So basically a husband and wife, two friends coming down. So average group size was about two people. <clears throat> 70, almost 75% of the people that came here came here with the express purpose of visiting the Rio Grande Valley for ecotourism. And the average person that came down here had already visited 14.5 times. So if you can establish a good business, you can have repeat customers that come down here if they're happy. And good news is, is 85% of the visitors that did come here indicated that they were likely or highly likely to return. So now we're gonna dive into a couple of, of tables. Um, like I said, this is one of those reports that great numbers, some of the reporting is, it's not bad reporting, it's just a little hard to follow, so I can't necessarily answer all the questions. Y'all may have to read the report yourself to understand some of the things. But this, uh, this table is looking at basically that party expenditure per trip, so that 2.3 people, how much did they spend? So in today's market in 2024, each couple, so two people, is going to spend about $2,500 per trip um, during those peak times versus off peak, they're gonna spend about $1,800. And then you can see on each of these, they break it down into access fees. So this is what those people are charging to come onto the property. Um, you know, food services, auto expenses, all that stuff. So again, if you, I would highly advise if you wanna take some time, you know, take pictures, that's great, by all means, take pictures. Um, but you can go and read this report and really get a good idea and look at these numbers. 
So breaking this down um, a little bit further, so this is the average per capita travel expenditures. So in 2024, people are gonna spend about $1,100 during the peak season and about almost just shy of $700 during the off peak season. Um, one thing I did forget to mention is, so you have obviously the in Rio Grande Valley, which they considered the Rio Grande Valley, I'm sure y'all, I don't need to tell y'all, but it's Hildago, Cameron, Star, and Willacy County. Anything outside of that, they did not consider to be Rio Grande Valley. And elsewhere is where people would come in to visit the Rio Grande Valley. They came for ecotourism, but they would come here and then, you know, go somewhere else. So it wasn't just a one shot trip. It was the Rio Grande Valley and other places. So for this purpose, y'all can just look at those um, in Rio Grande Valley numbers. So now we're going to look at what each visitor would spend basically per day while they were here. So one person is going to spend roughly $180 per day while they're here during the peak season and off peak about just, just shy of $180 per day. Okay, how much the Rio Grande Valley basically, I'll say, makes in a year off of ecotourism, so the annual expenditures. And these numbers really hit home. So if you, if you remember the numbers that I'm, I can't remember, shouldn't have said this, but I can't remember what numbers I gave. It was like $250 billion for wildlife watching. Billion or million, I can't, billion, billion. Um, here in the Rio Grande Valley alone in 2024, in one year during the peak season, the Rio Grande Valley made almost $260 million on ecotourism alone. And then off peak, $165 million. So that's really nothing to, to scoff at. There's, there's money to be made here. Now, a lot of what I just hit on are people that are traveling into the Rio Grande Valley. But what you all also need to realize is that the residents here are also willing to pay to come onto property to view wildlife. So a resident will spend about $480 during peak season and off peak they'll spend about $330. $330. So don't also forget to, while yes it's important to market to those large metropolitan areas outside of the Rio Grande Valley, don't forget to let people here in the Rio Grande Valley know that your property is open for wildlife viewing. Okay, so now that I just bored you all with a bunch of numbers, um, we're now going to transition into, okay, I've, I have convinced you that ecotourism is something for you. What do I need to do now? This is whether you have property, you just purchased property, you're thinking about purchasing property, you've had property for a couple of years. Just some things that y'all need to think about. So the first thing that I like to do is, you know, I tell people you need to date your property. I'm sure a lot of y'all are probably have been out of the dating game for a while. But if you think back, you, whenever you went on a date with somebody, you would sit down to, to dinner, go on a walk, what have you, but you would talk to that person. You would figure out, you know, um, do they have any siblings? Where did they go to high school? Where did they grow up? You would also develop your own opinion of, were they a very nice person? Were they funny? Were they just not your cup of tea and you never want to see them again? You figure out who that person is. Your property is no different. You need to figure out the characteristics of your property, the soil types, the topography, or how hilly or flat your property is, um, the weather patterns that are going to come through your property. Those are going to be able to tell you what you, it's not going to tell you what you can and can't do, but it's going to kind of limit some of the habitat practices or potentially what wildlife you can have on your property that people can come view. Learning the history of your property. So if you just purchased your property, learning about were there graze, was there grazing management? Were there responsible grazing practices? Or did people come in and just mow it 
you know, they had sheep and goats, which I live near the hill country, so I always use the example of people came in with some sheep and goats and they just hit it super hard and just grazed it down to just bare rock. Do you have any invasive species? We all pretty well have issues with feral hogs. That's pretty well straight across the board. Or neil guy. I, I, for, I always forget I'm down here and I can talk about neil guy and other exotic species. Uh, so just learning about the history of your property is going to also help you determine some of the management practices that you do. So a couple of resources that I like to use, and there are just, there are so many out there that I just narrowed it down to some that I like to recommend. So NRCS has, um, they have web soil survey and they have soil web. Both of them are great. Soil web for me is one of those that is a very easy, quick starter. Like you can get on it and it's pretty self, I'll say self explanatory, pretty user friendly. Web soil survey has a lot of great information. There is a little bit of a learning curve there for web, so web soil survey. Um, TPWD has a program called um, the Texas Ecosystem Analytical Mapper or TEAM. This one is a, is a good one. It can be a little finicky sometimes, but this one's gonna give you not only so soil information, it can also give you habitat. So basically what habitat types are on your property. Um, it can also give you some like geological information. So what type of rock formations you could find on your property. And the last one is um, just basic weather data from NOAA. So the climate data online, just getting basic weather information, especially if you're new to the area and you don't know when average rainfall is going to be, how much average rainfall is. Sometimes weather data is some of the most important data because especially if you're gonna do a prescribed fire, you are going to um, do um, any sort of like habitat management practices. You need to you know, spray herbicide or disc, you know, knowing what times of year are gonna be good to do that with weather conditions, that's good basic information to know. So now once you've learned about your property, you can go ahead and start creating your plan or while you're learning about your property, start to sort of create a plan. What are your goals on your property? What, what do you want to offer people? Wildlife watching, photography, stargazing, horseback riding, what activities are you going to want people to come onto your property to enjoy? Uh, are you gonna to wanna to build infrastructure? Are you generally providing restrooms are, are a good idea, but are you gonna to wanna to go past restrooms? Are you gonna to wanna to provide housing on your property? Um, picnic pavilions. Uh, and then, you know, are you gonna provide any additional services on your property? And whenever you're making your plan, you need to think details. The more detailed you can be, the better. So, you know, in your plan you say, I, I want to provide wildlife watching. I love wildlife. But my question to you is, what type of wildlife? Are you going to go the mammal route? Are you going to have people come in to see white-tailed deer? Are you lucky enough to have a Mexican free-tailed bat roosting colony on your property? And you're going to have people come and enjoy bat emergences? Are you going to go bring people in to watch birds on your property? Do you like the scaly critters and you're gonna go for um, herping so people come in to watch reptiles? Or are you gonna go a more non-traditional route and bring people in to come see butterflies and dragonflies? Which oddly enough, I think, and this is saying a lot because I know a lot of birders, I think people that come in to see um, dragonflies and, and butterflies are a lot more intense than birders are. If y'all know any birders, like they are super intense about dragonflies. They it, it is crazy what people will go to to watch dragonflies and take pictures of dragonflies. So my, my last example that I have is, you know, providing lodging. With lodging, you can go very simple. You can provide what they call primitive camping. So you provide a nice level site, people bring in their own tent and you supply water to them. There's no electricity, you could provide electricity, but it can be very simple or basic you can kind of take a step up from that and provide um, RV sites. So you provide water and electricity and they bring everything else. You can go all the way and you can build, you know, cabins or mini homes or whatever and people have all the accommodations. They can watch, you know, their football game or whatever whenever they're done hiking around for the day on your property. You can go somewhere in between where you do these like TP yurt type of things. So it's really just what your property can provide 
for what you want to provide on a budget. You can always start real small, start with primitive camping, and as you go along, get more revenue. You can start putting cabins on your property. It's always easier to, to go up than to scale back. So now when you're choosing activities for your property, um, the biggest one is you need to be realistic. The example I always use, like I said, I live up, uh, I live up in New Valley, so South Texas brush, on the edge of the South Texas brush transition into the hill country. The example I always use is I can build the best flamingo habitat ever. I can have these beautiful lush wetlands, but guess what? In case y'all didn't know, we don't get flamingos where I'm at. I, I, I can't use that example here because y'all actually had two flamingos last year that got, or just this past winter that kind of got lost and ended up here on the coast. So I can't exactly use that example here. But they're not common here, so you could, and you're only maybe gonna get two every like 10 or 15 years. So thinking of what species you wanna do and just being realistic what you can actually have on your property. Uh, keeping in mind other property goals. Um, you know, if, if you're wanting to build, you know, a bunch of solar panels and put a bunch of energy, um, you know, create revenue from uh, solar panels or wind turbines. Maybe not the best thing if you're doing wildlife. Um, there is that conflict there. Now, you know, we've already kind of touched on this over a couple different presentations, but you can absolutely do livestock and wildlife. They are, they're not quite the same, but they can very much mesh very nicely together. So just keeping other property goals in mind when you're choosing an activity. And then using what your property already has, whether it be unique features um, on your property. So if you have, again, a bat cave, um, you have a really cool rock formation on your property, just using what you already have on your property. And sometimes this can be challenging, um, especially when you know, you're purchasing a new property and it's a bit of a fixer upper property. It needs a little bit of work or you've had the property for a while and you've never dove into wildlife ecotourism and you're like, okay, I want to do this. I just don't know. I don't know what's, what's out there. I know I have birds. I like watching the birds. I just don't know what types of birds I have. Reaching out to people, reaching out to your county extension, your AgriLife County Extension agent, TPWD. Um, you can also hire consultants to come in if you want to hire somebody to come in and look at what you have. And people that are, I'll say, the experts that can be like, oh yes, that's that's a green jay, that's a kiskadee. They can point out those birds and be like, yeah, you have some really good bird diversity on your property. Um, so it's, it becomes a little bit less overwhelming for you. Um, and then probably the last and probably maybe the biggest one other than being realistic is choosing an activity that appeals to you. It doesn't mean you have to enjoy bird watching and be obsessed and be up at the butt crack of dawn every day out there looking for birds. It just has to mean that you don't hate birds because there's no point if you had a traumatic experience growing up where you were chased by a Canada goose or a, an angry mallard hen and you're just traumatized, you're like, I never want to see another bird again as long as I live. There's no point in bringing bird watching onto your property because you're gonna have to speak to people about birds all the time. You're gonna have to go potentially fill feeders. You're gonna see a lot of birds if you do bird watching. So just choosing something that appeals to you, that you're okay with. If you don't like reptiles, you probably don't want people coming onto your property looking at reptiles because they're going to want to show you their pictures and, and all that. So, <clears throat> okay, a couple lists of activities. Now, there are so many more out there, but this is just a, a, a short list that I compiled. And you don't just have to choose one activity. You can combine activities. There's a lot of activities that go very nicely together like bird watching and photography. You can put up, and we'll cover this a little bit in a little bit, but you can put up a viewing blind that people can come take pictures and view wildlife. Um, you can do hiking slash backpacking and horseback riding and mountain biking because you're gonna build trails for all of these. So you just need to pick, again, ones that appeal to you and what your property has available. And your property doesn't have to be 
huge. Some of these are a little bit restrictive. Generally, if people come hiking, they want to hike for a while. They don't want to hike for, you know, 15 minutes and they saw your whole property. They, you know, potentially want to hike for an hour, two hours. But stargazing is one that I recommend for people that have a small property. The only thing you really need is you just need a property that is far enough outside of any large city center that there's no light pollution. So you don't see town with the lights because the stars, I mean, they're there. You just need a little, an area really no bigger than this stage here, maybe some benches and somebody that knows stars and people can come out to your property and learn about the stars because I don't know about y'all, but I never get tired of looking at the night sky when it's completely dark outside. It's gorgeous. Uh, okay. okay, now I kind of just touched on this a little bit is with, you know, a lot of these, you don't need to be an expert because be, becoming really good at bird identification or reptile identification or even just knowing the constellations and all the features in the sky can take years. So you don't need to take years to become an expert before you start your business. This is where you can bring in somebody. You can bring in a guide that already has that training. And you can go one of two routes. You can either directly hire the guides yourself, meaning you have people that want to come in and stargaze. They're going to contact you directly. And then once you have a group of people, you will then say, hey, you talk to the guide and be like, hey, I have a group of five people that want to come out and stargaze on this date. Are you available? And they say, sure. And they come out. If you don't necessarily want to deal with the general public face to face or speak with a bunch of people, sometimes what you can do is figure out some guiding companies that are in your area. So people that do stargazing already and they already have a business set up as that, that's what they do is they take people out and they stargaze. You contact them and be like, hey, I have my property available. I would like to you know, offer it up to you. And basically people say, I want to stargaze. They contact that company or that guiding service. And then that guiding service will then contact you and be like, hey, I have some people that want to come out on this date. Are you available? And you say, absolutely. Now, if you do decide to hire your own guides, you can go a couple different places. Uh, I do recommend reaching out to a lot of, I'll call them naturalist societies. So Texas Master Naturalist, Audubon Society, Herpetological Society. A lot of those groups, the people that are in those groups in, are in those groups for a reason because they enjoy it. So contacting them, they may have somebody that is knowledgeable enough or comfortable with coming out to speak to your group of people. And then, of course, when in doubt, if you reach out to those people and you can't find anyone, you know, Google. We just Google everything nowadays. So Google, you can reach out. There may be somebody that already has an established business in your area that may be able to help you out. Okay, so now we're going to dive into wildlife watching in and of itself and some things that you all need to keep in mind. Now, Ernesto kind of already hit on this in his presentation, but with wildlife watching, when people come here to the Rio Grande Valley, they're coming here to enjoy what y'all have to offer. Yes, Neogai are great. Yes, Neogai are very tasty, but they're not native. They don't belong here. So we want to, and part of that with ecotourism is we're trying to promote what is naturally occurring here. So you are going to promote that uh, species or features that are native and naturally occurring here. So you can do go one of two routes with wildlife watching. You can either have people come to your property and they can hike around to see what y'all have, which this can be uh, more so prohibitive if to smaller properties, obviously. Uh, but the one that I recommend and can be used on any size property doesn't matter is you can put up these wildlife viewing blinds. With these wildlife viewing blinds, people come in, they're in a building, a structure of some sort, and they sit there and they watch wildlife. They don't go anywhere. The wildlife comes to them rather than them having to go to the wildlife. So with these wildlife viewing blinds, basically what you're doing is you're providing 
something to attract these animals there to watch. Now, the components of a blind, and this can vary from blind to blind, it just depends. But the only really required thing is a barrier of some sorts. Because the point of a blind is that you are trying to obscure the wildlife's view of the people inside. Basically, you're trying to keep the wildlife there as long as you can because people, especially if you have kids, they tend to move around a lot. And whenever you move, that disturbs the wildlife. So you're just trying to hide those movements, conceal the people that are there. So that barrier can be anything as simple as some sort of a mesh curtain with little holes cut out into it. It can be as elaborate as a solid wall with these viewing ports cut out like in this picture. Optional things that you can have in the blind, you can have seating. You can either put in permanent fixed seating like this one, it's, it's a bench that's, uh, I would assume, cemented into the ground. You can have uh, folding chairs of some kind. It's, it's really up to you and what you want on your property. You can put up an exclosure or an exterior fence, and I very much recommend this if you have livestock or you have problematic wildlife and want to keep them out, because generally with these viewing areas, you work pretty hard to put them together, and the last thing you want is a feral hog to come in and tear up your nice new plants or your uh, nice new water feature that you just made. And generally people don't want to see feral hogs, generally speaking. Um, and then accessibility is one thing I very much recommend. Is, uh, you know, like I said, we're, you're going to have a wide variety of different ages coming in. You're going to have a lot of different people from all sorts of walks of life. You make it easily accessible. You could have kids. You can have people with all sorts of disabilities. It just opens you up to more people being able to come onto your property. So consulting somebody about making these blinds ADA compliant, which generally with blinds, it's not that hard to make it ADA compliant. It's just making a nice level path, making sure doorways are wide enough that if there are steps, there's a ramp that's, that's there and makes it easily accessible. So these are just a couple of different examples of viewing areas as well as different blinds. So a lot of these are actually on state parks um, here in Texas, um, but you can go as simple as, you know, um, building three walls, cutting out some viewing holes, and sticking a bench in there. You can go as fancy as you build a structure that has air conditioning and fans and all sorts of different other features to make people nice and comfortable. Um, you can get as artsy as, and yes, this is a bird blind in the bottom, the bottom middle one. It is a bird blind. Um, if you want to get really architectural with it, um, you can do that. It's simply what your budget's going to allow and what your brain capacity for creativity is, which mine is not. I need a plan in front of me that is, is laid out and it says, you know, connect part A to, to part B. Okay, special note with photography setup. So photographers are very particular about how things are set up because they're trying to get the best quality picture they can. The first thing is gonna be blind orientation. When people are taking pictures, you want your subject matter nice and lit up. So you're gonna, your blind is either going to be what they categorize as a morning or an evening blind. So a morning blind is going to be facing west because that sun is going to be coming up behind them and as it comes up, it's going to light everything up in front of them. The evening blind will be opposite. So that evening blind will be facing east because as the sun is setting behind them, sun is behind them, but those subjects out in front of them are still very nice and lit up. And with a photography setup, this is something I very much, if you're going to go this route, very much recommend either just speaking with somebody that does photo is an avid photographer. They're gonna be able to give you more tips and tricks and don't just speak to one, speak to multiple. Everybody has their own set of preferences, um, their own little quirks about them. So just getting a good consensus of what people do or don't want is gonna give you a better idea. Now the composition of the photography area. You're going to want 
a variety of different features within that, or it's recommended anyway. So having different food sources available, whether they be natural or artificial. Generally with photographers, they're gonna lean towards the natural. If I were to show y'all a picture of a ruby-throated hummingbird that's at a feeder versus a ruby-throated hummingbird that's at a red yucca flower, I can guarantee y'all are gonna say of the two pictures that you prefer, you're probably gonna say, I would prefer, I like the picture of them at the red yucca a little bit better. It's just more aesthetically pleasing to us to see them as something natural versus artificial. So providing different types, so those artificial and naturally occurring. Different distances, photography distances of those features. You're gonna get people that come in with a camera setup that costs more than a car, like a $60,000 camera setup. You're also gonna get people that come in with a camera set up that only costs about a couple hundred dollars. And that, you know, that camera setup that costs about as much as a car is gonna have more bells and whistles, more capabilities than that little couple hundred dollar camera setup. So just giving different distances of photography opportunities is again gonna open up your business to more people. Um, perching limbs are a big one if you're gonna do birds. Um, Personally, I, don't, I like watching birds. I don't like photographing birds. They don't hold still long enough for me and I don't have the patience for it. So, but those perching limbs, a lot of birds, they'll go out, feed, they come back to a limb to eat whatever they just grabbed, especially if it's some sort of an, an insect. Um, hummingbirds do this, they'll go feed, sit for a little bit, go back to the feeder. The last thing is the height of the blind. So you can go one of two routes. You can either go ground level, meaning you step, you know, you walk on the ground right into the blind. And that's going to be great for, for a lot of birds. It can also be good for, for mammals as well. But if you want stuff that's a little bit more eye level, so in this example, you have that water feature. This is a bunker blind. So you can see there's a set of steps off on the left. You can see those handrails. So people go down into the blind, they put their camera set up. And when they're taking pictures, they're now eye level with anything that goes into that water feature. So you have a bobcat, a white-tailed deer, you have doves, ducks, turkey come into that water feature. Instead of having to lay on the ground on their stomach for hours and on the end till that wildlife comes in, they now get to sit in a chair and have a nice uh, level, eye level picture with that wildlife. So, you are going to be drawing in this wildlife using what they require to survive, which y'all know this, y'all need the same things to survive is food, water, shelter, and space. So that uh, those first three are pretty self-explanatory. The space is simply the amount of area a species requires to have enough food, water, and shelter. So basically it's what we, in our, in our world, we call their home range and it depends upon the size of the species, how big their home range or how much space they require. Now I touched on this, when you're providing those resources, you can either go artificial or you can go natural. There are pros and cons to both, which I'm gonna discuss. So with artificial, the good thing with artificial is it's as long as you put it out there, it's always there. As long as you check the feeders on a regular basis, it's as unlimited as you're gonna make it. And because there are no seasonal limitations, because it's artificially provided, a lot of the times that wildlife is going to be pretty reliable during drought years, during really rough times when you have a cold snap come through. Those animals already know where that food or that water is, so they'll come in pretty reliably. Um, the downside is it can be pretty costly, especially to purchase corn to purchase bird seed, especially good quality bird seed, can be pretty pricey. Uh, disease transmission is, is one that's a concern because animals are coming into a, I'll say a manufactured surface. It can hold diseases for a long period of time. So there's going to be a maintenance portion to that where you are going to need to disinfect it every so often to, to keep those animals healthy. And then lastly, you know, I touched on this, is that aesthetic aspect. People don't necessarily want to 
to, to see birds or deer at you know, an artificial feeder. They would probably prefer to see them at a plant of some kind. But again, you, know, you can draw animals in with this. So at the end of the day, do you want to see the animal bad enough? It's up to them. Okay, then if you go for natural resources, so again, that aesthetic aspect there. We kind of enjoy that idea of it being naturally occurring. Your wildlife diversity is probably gonna be a little bit higher if you go with the natural. So again, back to birds. So there's a group of birds called flycatchers, so vermilion flycatchers. They like to go out, they like to catch, actively catch insects, flying insects. It's what they do. They're very acrobatic little things. And it's really hard to draw them into a feeder. They really won't come in for mealworms. But if you provide natural plants, those are native plants, those native plants are natural.